So security geeks have known for a long time that if you do crypto in the presence of different types of faults, then you get um, all sorts of errors that allow you to attack the crypto system. There's entire conferences devoted to um, this fault-based analysis of crypto systems. Um, and for example, that one on the right's been going on for about 10 years. So that's a diagram of elliptic curve cryptography, which is a system that is particularly vulnerable to faults. If you get a fault in the private key stored in memory, you leak the private key. If you get a fault when you're performing the operation, you leak the private key. If you get a fault on the uh, random numbers that are used, you leak the private key. You can probably see a pattern emerging there. Um, so what radiation does is it goes through different semiconductors. That's an example of a transistor, and it upsets the charge in that device. So typically a zero becomes a one when you get extra charge inserted into that device, and that's a fault that then reflects onto the cryptography. So most people don't really care about this. These guys do. This is the UN agency that's charged with monitoring fissile materials around the world. So they make sure that stuff, nuclear material, doesn't get diverted and used for weapons purposes and they obviously have to run their gear in relatively high radiation environments. Here's an example, this is a spent fuel storage pond. So what you might have there is a camera that looks down on the pond, it takes a photo, it digitally signs it, and then it sends it out to make sure that no, no fuel rods are being removed from that pond. Another example is in reactor fueling, uh, which will come up on the next slide. And again, you want to audit what's going into that reactor and the decay products and isotopes and whatever that are coming out of that reactor. So you also record that, you digitally sign it, you send it back out to a central monitoring station. So this is all crypto, susceptible to faults that has to run in this relatively high radiation environment. That's the third example, that's a non-destructive assay device. So that's radioactive waste that's coming out. So what you want to do is assess, again, what isotopes are in there, how much, um, whether it's, for example, you know, different types of plutonium, some is fissile, some isn't, you digitally sign that, you send the audit log back out to the central location that monitors it. So what the people running these reactors can do is they can actually induce faults. You're expecting radiation anyway, so what they can do is produce even more radiation to affect your device in the hope of actually producing a fault that may then leak the private key. So the reactor operator may potentially be hostile. So a standard response to this is, we'll just chill it, put huge amounts of lead around it. That's called a lead castle. Each one of those bricks weighs between 10 to 20 kilograms, so 20 to 40 pounds. It's heavy, it's expensive, and it's not RRHS compliant. Um, and in any case, it doesn't, doesn't do all the shielding you want. That is a way of generating X-rays. You take electrons, you accelerate them, you slam them into something, and through a process called Bremsstrahlung, it then produces X-rays. Now, if you substitute beta particles for electrons and lead for that tungsten anode, that's basically what happens if you fire beta particles into lead shielding. It converts it to a different type of radiation, but there's still radiation there. Shielding neutrons is even more difficult. These things are really nasty. So you've basically got fast neutrons coming out of the reactor that you need to slow down, typically with hydrogen, so water, paraffin, um, polyethylene, something like that. And then you absorb it in something like lead, concrete, or whatever. If you go out and look for a research on these sorts of things, like what happens if you, if you subject these to radiation, you get devices like this, this modern, very current processor, which we fired gamma rays at. And what happened was it failed, not because the processor failed, but because the PWM speed controller in the fan died, the fan stopped, and then the processor failed. Um, this is a complete system, which is what I'm more interested in. You know, what happens when you subject a complete system to radiation? So this is a um, TI-based um, fault-resistant device used for things like automotive control. It's got error correction on everything, redundant buses, redundant CPUs, redundant clocks and everything. So we can actually build reliable systems out of unreliable components. That's an Airbus control system. So you've got two, they're duplicated, two watchdogs, they cross-check each other. If one of them fails, it falls back to the second one. So that's relatively unreliable components used to build a reliable system. So typically you'd start with something like this. A standard CPU, you've got a watchdog timer, it resets the CPU every 10 milliseconds, unless the CPU resets the watchdog to ensure that it's still running. Then you've got code that checksums the actual remaining code that's running in there to make sure it hasn't been corrupted. In crypto, a particular problem is that you've got all sorts of transformations. Your encrypted private key becomes an unencrypted private key, goes into a big num accelerator and is then used. So for each one of these transformations, after you've applied it, you have to work backwards to make sure that you get back the original data you stated with, started with. Once you've got the final data you need to use in memory, you check sum it to make sure that it hasn't been corrupted as it was sitting in memory. You use it, you then check sum it a second time to make sure that as you perform the crypto, it wasn't corrupted at some point. Um, a nice thing about crypto systems is the asymmetric. So you've got public private key operations that match up. So after every private key operation, you then perform the corresponding public key operation to make sure that you, it actually verifies whatever was happening. So you can detect whether there was a fault in the private key operation. So that's all the defensive measures you can use. You then want to analyze this. So you take your device and you subject it to gamma radiation or neutrons. And what the device does, you're not bothering with the crypto, you're just recording a trace of all the faults that occur in this device and sending it out to an external device before the radiation actually destroys the device. Um, neutrons are particularly good at destroying things. Then once you've got this trace of all these faults, you take your favorite virtual machine environment, you take any software you want, and we'll be publishing this once it's done, and you inject it into your virtual machine, and then you can simulate this radiation-induced fault environment without actually having to have access to a source of gamma rays and neutrons. 
Um, this is really cool stuff. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs>